All right, we've talked about our moles. We've talked about how do we count moles. We say we've got, oh, one car. It's got four doors, let's say, this time instead of wheels. So one mole of cars would have four moles of wheels. We've now talked about how we weigh our molecules. We just add up the atomic mass of each part of it to get what we call the molar mass or molecular mass of the molecule. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about balancing reactions. And what do I mean by balancing reactions? Well, if this was a face-to-face -face class, what I would do is I would come charging into class riding my unicycle. And I do this whole thing while riding my unicycle. It's a little bit harder to do in my little video screen right here. So you just get to hear me talking about it. But if you want to, you can picture me riding a unicycle right now. How do we make a bicycle? That's what these pictures are asking right now. Can we do what's in this first line and make a bicycle by taking one wheel, adding a frame, and making ourselves a bicycle? And most of you say, um, no, because somewhere that second wheel just appeared on the right-hand side. We only had one wheel on the left. We had two wheels on the right. Where did that extra wheel come from? You can't do that. And you'd be right. You can't do that. You can't make one wheel and a frame make a bicycle. Now, what if we were trying to make a unicycle? Could we do two wheels? and a unicycle frame in order to make a unicycle? And you say, well, yeah, I'll make a unicycle, but, but you'd also have another wheel left over here, right? So what you drew on the picture there isn't correct either because somewhere a wheel just disappeared into space. And our experience is that wheels don't generally disappear into space, only pencils, pens, and other parts of a pair of socks. So. What's the only one that works? The only one that works is this one on the bottom that says, hey, I've got two wheels and a frame to make myself a bicycle. Because I've got two wheels on the left and I've got two wheels on the right. They've been incorporated into something new, but there's still two wheels on the left, two wheels on the right, one frame on the left and one frame on the right. And it turns out we're gonna do the exact same thing for chemistry. We're gonna make sure that whenever we write a chemical reaction, whenever we say this reacts with this to make these other things, we want to make sure that we're not creating things, we're not creating an additional wheel coming out of nowhere. We want to make sure we're not destroying things, that there's a wheel that disappeared into the universe somewhere. We want to make sure that if we had two wheels to begin with, we got two wheels on the end. And what are our wheels in chemistry? Our wheels are our atoms. We want to make sure that we have the same number of atoms at the beginning as we have at the end. If we have three hydrogen atoms when we start our experiment, no matter what happens, we have to have three hydrogen atoms at the end. There's no way around that. We can't make extra hydrogen atoms. We can't disappear hydrogen atoms. We have to just make sure that they balance. And how would we do that? Well, if I gave you this first reaction up here and I said, I'm gonna do this reaction, You'd say, well, Professor Clements, you can't do it with one wheel. What you actually have to do is you have to actually put a two in front of this and say, I need two wheels and a frame to make my bicycle. And that's what we're going to do in chemistry, too. We're going to start putting in these numbers here in front of our different atoms and molecules in order to make sure that everything balances out, that we have the same number of atoms on the left as we have on the right. So let's quickly get to an example of talking about chemical reactions. Well, how do we describe chemistry? We usually describe chemistry, and people think of chemistry as somebody mixing two things together and <laughs> things explode. So we're mixing things and we're making new things. That is chemistry, what most people think. Okay? So we can say we burned methane in the presence of oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. It sounds very formal, but let's write that out as what we call a chemical reaction. And when we write out a chemical reaction, we write out the formulas of each of the molecules inside there, and some other things that help us know what's going on. So methane, you might not know what methane is, so I'm gonna tell you. It's CH4, and this is also what we call natural gas. If you have a gas stove at home and you turn that on, methane is what comes out. Now, at room temperature, what is the methane? Is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Right? It's gas, it goes and comes out. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a G in parentheses down there that tells us this guy is coming out as a gas. Now, I'm going to combine it in the presence of oxygen, so I'm gonna put an O here. And I put this plus, this plus sign tells me that I am combining these things, I'm putting them together. Okay? So I'm combining methane over there with my oxygen. Now, do I just write oxygen? Well, 
And when we breathe, right, we're breathing gaseous oxygen. And so I'm going to go ahead and write a G over here. And that looks pretty good, but it turns out it's not actually really good because there's some elements on the periodic table who just don't like to be alone. Oxygen does not like to be alone. He will never show up to the party alone. He'll always have someone with him. Now, if he can't find anyone else to go with him, he'll just find another oxygen to go with him. And it turns out every time we just talk about oxygen, we just use the word oxygen, we're just talking about oxygen by itself, it's never by itself, it's always in a pair. And so it's always O2. That's not to say that in a molecule with other atoms, like it's got carbons and hydrogens, that there can't be just one oxygen. That's just fine. He just needs buddies, somebody to go with him. But if he can't find any other buddies, he's going to go with another oxygen. And these are what we call the molecular diatonics. The molecular diatonics, those are those atoms that never appear by themselves on the periodic table. They always appear in pairs. And which are they? Is it just oxygen? It turns out there's a bunch of them. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic that I use. If you look up, there's several mnemonics out there. There's also a way of remembering it just by looking at a shape of the periodic table. But here's the one I like, which is I have no bright or clever friends. And if we look at the beginning of each one of those, I, H, N, B, R, O, C, L, and F, we've got iodine, hydrogen, nitrogen, bromine, oxygen, chlorine, and fluorine as molecular diatomics. If we are ever just talking about fluorine, we're not just talking about F, we're talking about F2. Now I can use language that says I'm talking about a fluorine atom, and there I'm talking about F. But you're never actually going to find a fluorine atom just floating around in nature all by itself. But I can't talk about it, even if I'm never going to find it in nature. But if I just say fluorine, I'm talking about F2. If I just say hydrogen, I'm talking about H2. And if I just say oxygen, I'm talking about O2. So make sure you know these ones and can recognize them so that when we are writing out reactions and stuff, you can put I2 and H2. If you look at a periodic table and you find those, most of them are in the top right. You see uh, element number seven is nitrogen, then oxygen and then fluorine next to each other, and then we go down chlorine, bromine, bro chlorine, bromine and iodine. And if you notice, they just make a little L-shaped. So nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, make a little L shape. The only one who's kind of funky on that is hydrogen. He's in the top left of the periodic table. But if you just remember that shape, that's another way of remembering your molecular diatomics. All right, so back up to our reaction up here. We've got methane reacting with oxygen to form. So these are the two things that are combining. They're making something new. And how we generally specify that is just by putting a little arrow off to the right. You'll see people use all sorts of arrows. Sometimes it's just with an arrow up like that doesn't really mean anything different. Now, occasionally you'll see people use two-sided arrows. That means something different, but we'll get to that in a different chapter. But that arrow is the reaction arrow, and it separates what's happening, what's, what's combining to react, and the things that we make. And I'm going to form carbon dioxide. Now, we know how to write carbon dioxide because we learned how to name covalent compounds. How did I know it was covalent? Carbon is a nonmetal. Oxygen is a nonmetal. Breathe out CO2, so we know it's a gas. And water, we all know water, H2O. And I'm going to tell you it's a gas in this case. Uh, it's not always obvious whether water is a gas or a liquid, and so I'm just telling you in this case that it's a gas. So what do we have? We have CH4 plus O2 goes to CO2 plus H2O. Turns out these things over here that are on the left-hand side of that reaction arrow do have a name. We call those reactants. Oops, I hit the wrong key there. We call those reactants. Anything before the reaction arrow, the things we're combining. On the right hand side, the things after the reaction arrow, we call the products. 
Oops. So reactants are the things on the left, products are the things on the right. All right. So that's how we write chemical reactions. Plus signs in between things that we're reacting, plus signs in between things that we're making, because CO2 is separate from water. They're not combined to each other. They're separate molecules that do their own things. And then we have that reaction arrow in the middle that tells us that. Now, if you remember, what we were just talking about is we have to make sure that everything's balanced, that if we start with two wheels, we end with two wheels. And we said that our atoms are our wheels in this case. So I need a little more space, so I'm going to scroll down here. You might have space in your notes, in which case you're good. So I'm going to write this again. I'm going to be a little bit lazy, as we often are when we're balancing reactions, and I'm going to leave off my phase notations. There's G under there that tells me it's a gas. By the way, other phase notations that we need to know are S for a solid, L for a liquid, and people usually write it as this kind of cursive L, so it doesn't look like just like a one. And then the other one we're going to see quite a lot is AQ, which stands for aqueous. And aqueous means dissolved in water. If I take salt and I pour it in my hand, that is solid salt. But if I pour that into water and stir it up, I now have aqueous salt, salt dissolved in water. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have the same number of atoms on the left as we do on the right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to identify all the different atoms I have. And so I know on the left I see I've got a carbon atom, I've got hydrogen atoms, and I've got oxygen atoms. And I want to list those same ones in the same order on the right. It really doesn't matter what order you put it in. I usually just go left to right on my reactant side, but you can do whatever works for you. Then I just start counting things. I say, look, on the left I've got one carbon atom, so I'm just going to put a one here in front of my carbon. What do I have? I have hydrogen, but I've got four of them. That's what that four subscript means, and so I'm going to put a four here. And oxygen, we decided it was a molecular diatomic, and so I've got two of them there. On the right, what do I have? I have one carbon. I have how many hydrogens? Two hydrogens. And how many oxygens? People are very tempted to write down two, but oftentimes the same atom appears in two different molecules, and I need to take that into account. So I've got two atoms of oxygen in CO2, but I've got one in my H2O for a total of three. Now we check, is this balanced out? Well, carbon is, it's great. I've got one carbon to begin with. I have one carbon at the end. I have not created or destroyed carbon. I'm all good. How about my hydrogen? That's not so good. Right? That's not equal. I don't have four hydrogens at the beginning and four hydrogens at the end. I only have two at the end. So what that says is somewhere I just disappeared some hydrogen. and Well, I can't do that. So what did we do in the previous case? In the previous case, we said, well, let me just add a second wheel. I'm going to put a two in front of the wheel to say that we need two wheels. I'm going to do the same thing here for my balanced reactions. But what, how do I know what I need more of? Well, I've got four hydrogens on this side. I've got two on this side. And the easiest way is to always add hydrogens. Don't try to take hydrogens away. And how do we add hydrogens? We add hydrogens by adding more molecules that have hydrogen. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you something wrong that I see people do sometimes. Occasionally, they're going to be like, well, let me just change this guy to a two. And now I've got two hydrogens, and my hydrogens are balanced out. But what did you do? you change the identity of one of our molecules. We don't have a wheel anymore. We've got a cat. CH4 and CH2 are not the same molecule. You change the actual molecule, and we can't do that. We can say, hey, let's get ourselves another wheel. But we can't say, let's turn our wheel into a cat, because you can't make a bicycle using a cat. So we can't change the identity of the molecule. We can't change any of these subscripts. Those subscripts never change when you're balancing reactions. The only thing we can do is change how many of those molecules we have. So if I want a total of four hydrogens on the right here, I need to add more molecules that have hydrogen in them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's have two water molecules. And if I have two water molecules and each one has 
two hydrogens in it, I now have a total of one, two, three, four hydrogens. And so I'm going to cross out all three of these things and count them all again. It seems a little tedious, but my carbon didn't change. I have one. My hydrogen, I now have two things that contain two. That's a total of four. My oxygen, it's tempting people to say, oh, I've got three still. But what did I do? When I changed to two water molecules, I now have two oxygens from water molecules and two oxygens from my CO2 for a total of four oxygen. So it's really important anytime you change one of those coefficients that you recheck all of your numbers to make sure they haven't changed. All right, so carbon's balanced now, hydrogen's balanced now. How about my oxygen? It's not balanced yet. I've got two on the left and four on the right. I created some extra oxygens from absolutely nothing. I can't do that. So what do I need to do? Always you want to add things. So I've got more on the right, so I want to add some to the left so it balances out. And I'm going to go ahead in green and put a two in front of here. And that makes it now so I have four oxygens. I always cross out everything else and double check it. In this case, I still have one and four because I didn't change anything about my carbon or hydrogens. I now have the same number of everything on both sides, and I have what we call a balanced chemical reaction. So this is now a balanced chemical reaction. But I'm not entirely done yet, because you might recall, as I said at the start of this, I said, hey, I'm going to be a little bit lazy as I balance this and not write my phase notations. It can sometimes get a little messy up there when you're doing all that balancing and stuff. And so what I usually do is do my balancing and then rewrite it when I'm done using the coefficients that I figured out before. So I'm going to write this out as CH4. A balanced chemical reaction always has phase notations. It's always got my arrows. And 2H2O gas. Let me scroll that so you can see it. And that is what we call a balanced chemical reaction. The word I just used here is this is called a coefficient. So we say the coefficient in front of oxygen is a 2. That's different than this guy here, which is called a subscript, which counts within that molecule how many oxygens do I have. So again, the car analogy, to say a car is a frame with four wheels, that would be part of a subscript to say there's four wheels because there's four wheels in every car. But I can have seven cars. That would be a coefficient. Right? I've got seven cars, each of which contain four wheels. So that is my subscript there. That's how we balance chemical reactions. We're going to do a few more examples. And hopefully, it'll start to make a little bit of sense. You really only can learn this by practicing, so you definitely want to go out and find some reactions to balance. All right, so here's one we're going to try to balance. I like to draw that little line in between so I can separate out my reactants on the left from my products on the right. I generally just list out all the different elements that I see from left to right. right antimony, sulfur, hydrogen, and chlorine. And then keep them in the same order on the right. S, B, S, H, and C, L. So now I just go about counting things. SB2 tells me that I've got two antimonies. S3 says I've got three sulfurs. And HCl says I've got one of each of those. On the right, one antimony, three chlorines. That goes down here. It's going to be a little out of order on the right, but that's OK. Two hydrogens and one sulfur. Now, am I balanced out? It's pretty obvious that I'm not. I have two antimonies on the left, only one on the right. And so what am I going to do? Well, I always want to add things. So I'm going to need to add something that has antimony on the right, which means I'm going to squeeze in a two right there in front of my antimony. It's very tempting to be like, OK, let me do that. I'm actually going to change colors here. Let me do that and put a two here. It didn't change. There we go. And it's very tempting just to write two and be like, OK, now I'm going to balance my sulfur and go on. But it's always good to double check everybody and cross everybody out. I'm going to go ahead and say I've got two of that sulfur. I still got one over here. Hydrogen, I still got two. But look, my chlorine, 
I now have two of them, each of which contain three for a total of six. So it's important that you check all your different elements whenever you put one of those new coefficients in there. All right, so now I've got three sulfurs on the left and only one sulfur on the right, so guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to add myself in some more of these guys so I can add some more sulfur. How many do I need? I need a total of three, and so I'm going to put a three in front of my H2S. Recount everything. It seems a little tedious, but it's good to make sure we don't make any mistakes. We do still have only two antimonies. We now have three sulfurs. How many hydrogens? We've got three molecules, each of which contain two, two, four, six. We've got a total of six hydrogens, and we have six chlorines. Okay, moving on to the next one, hydrogen. How do we figure out what that is? I've got one on the left, six on the right. I always want to add things. So I need to add more hydrogen on the left for a total of six. And so I'm going to put a six in front of HCl there. That gives me a total of six chlorines. I cross everything out, count everything again. I still have two antimonies. I still have three sulfurs. But now I have six hydrogen and six chlorine. And if you look, I've now balanced everything out. Now it's a bit ugly up there. I didn't leave myself enough space to write all those things in. And that happens all the time. I kind of did that on purpose this time. Balancing can be a little bit messy. But at the end, you want to rewrite it and make it nice. So my balanced reaction is SB2S3 solid plus 6HCl aqueous goes to 2SB lowercase b, Cl3 solid plus 3H2S gas. And it looks something like that. That is my balanced chemical reaction. If you're not sure about how to do this and you're worried about you're going to make mistakes, it never hurts when you write out this last one just to double check. I've got two antimonies, I've got two antimonies, etc. Check your sulfur, hydrogen, and chlorine, and just make sure that it's all balanced out there at the end. Now, oftentimes we're going to see those common ions in our reactions. What are those common ions? Things like the nitrate groups and things like that. You remember from that table that we talked about in chapter six where we were memorizing about nitrates, nitrites, sulfates, sulfites, phosphates, carbonates, all those common groups. They appear commonly in reactions and you can certainly balance them by looking at nitrogen, looking at oxygen, making sure everything's balanced. But it turns out if you want to save yourself a little bit of time, and you don't have to, if this confuses you, just ignore it. But if you want to save yourself a little bit of time, if you notice that one of your common ions appears on the left and appears on the right, so it's got to appear on both sides, it, doesn't, it can't react during this reaction, then you can balance it as a group instead of balancing it as individual atoms. What does that look like? When I make my table here, I'm going to say I've got cobalt. And instead of listing nitrogen and oxygen separately, I'm going to list the group NO3 and just balance that that way. And then I've got H and S. And I'm going to do the same thing on the right. Cobalt, NO3, H, and S. And then I count those as a group. So when I'm counting, I count one cobalt. I count two nitrate groups, two hydrogens, and one sulfur. And just in case you're thinking about it, you're like, Professor Clements, what about those molecular diatomics? Can I just talk about hydrogens? And yes, you can down here because we're just counting atoms. We're not saying, I have hydrogen. We're saying, I've got these hydrogen atoms as part of these other molecules. So they've got buddies. They're fine. All right. On the right, what do I have? I have one cobalt. I've got one sulfur. I've got one hydrogen and one nitrate, one of everything. I want to balance that out. What do I need? I need two nitrates on this side. How am I going to get that? By putting a two in front of my HNO3. I cross everything out. I count my cobalts again. I count nitrates. I count hydrogens and sulfurs. And in one step, this one was balanced. And it looks like this when we write it out. CO, NO3, two aqueous. And by the way, it's good practice when we're doing these kind of things to think about what would the name of that molecule be? Hopefully you get cobalt 2 nitrate plus H2S gas. 
goes to COS plus 2 HNO3 aqueous. Looks something like that. That is our balanced chemical reaction. Now, what do we use these balanced reactions for? We use these balanced reactions to talk about, well, how much of this do we need if we're going to make what we want? And the examples here in this reaction here, if I'm making bicycles, right, two wheels and a frame make a bicycle, I need to know that ratio if I'm going to say, well, what do I need in order to make 14 bikes? And you look and you say, well, there's one frame for every bicycle, so you need 14 frames. And there's two wheels for every bicycle, so you need 2 times 14 equals 28 wheels. Those ratios are really, really important for figuring it out. Or you might be like, you know, I've got this big pile of wheels sitting around. I wonder how many bikes I can make from it. And you think, well, you know, I've got uh, 30 wheels around. Well, that's going to make 15 bicycles. And you can figure those kind of things out intuitively for wheels and frames and bicycles because our brains can picture it. But when you start saying, I've got this reaction and I've got this many methane molecules reacting with this many oxygen molecules and I want to know how many of these do I, it gets really confusing. But the concept is exactly the same. It's just I, I need two of these and three of these to make something new. So that ratio is always preserved. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this bike example for a little while to um, help us figure out how we can do these kind of ratios. So what I'm going to say is that two wheels plus one frame makes myself a bicycle. Now, as a chemist, I'm not going to write B for bicycle. I'm going to write that it is a frame with two wheels. Looks a little funny, but uh, I hope you know what I mean. So let's use some examples. We said, hey, if I've got, if I want to make 14 bicycles, I want to know how many wheels do I need? Right? To make 14 bikes, how many wheels? Well, what does that mean? It means I'm starting with the information that I have 14 bikes, and I'm trying to figure out how many wheels I need. And so what does that look like? It looks like this. Wheels. Where is wheels going to go? I'm trying to get it, and so it's going to go on top. Notice how I'm starting with units again. This one. Where does that one go? It goes on the bottom, because I need it to cancel. Ba-ding, 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 ba-ding. Oops. I canceled out things that I didn't shouldn't cancel. I want the wheels at the end. I, sometimes we get a little overzealous. Let's cancel, cancel, cancel. I do it too. All right. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us we need to know what's the ratio of wheels to bicycles. Where do we get that information from? Well, we always get that information as chemists from our balanced chemical reaction. And what does our balanced chemical reaction tell us? That there's two wheels for every one bicycle. <clears throat> so if we want 14 bikes, 14 times 2 is 28, we need 28 wheels to do it. And so these ratios that we get from chemical reactions turn out to be really important for figuring out what we need. If we're trying to burn methane, for example, we need to know how much methane do we need if we're trying to make a certain amount of CO2. Or from an uh, environmental standpoint, we're making this many tons of CO2. How much methane did we burn in order to do that? That might be useful information to know. And we're always going to use these ratios from balanced chemical reactions to get us from one thing in a chemical reaction to another thing in a chemical reaction. And the cool thing is, is we can use it for anything. We can use it for how many wheels do we need if we have this many frames, or how many bicycles do we get if we have this many frames. Anything in our chemical reaction, the ratio of twos and ones and ones are going to tell us how those things relate to each other. And we're going to see that a lot more as we continue to move forward with our chemical reactions. So for example, if I had titanium plus oxygen makes titanium dioxide. Now that's its common name. Its official name would be titanium 4 oxide. What does it say? It says it takes one titanium and one oxygen molecule, notice our molecular diatomic there, to make this new molecule titanium dioxide. 
So if I wanted to make five titanium dioxides, what would I need? Turns out what it says is one of these and one of these make one of these. So if I wanted to make five titanium dioxides, I'd need five titaniums and five oxygens. A little boring when everything's one to one to one, but what about in this second reaction here, the one we wrote earlier about methane? Here it's telling us a little more interesting things, that there's some more ratios going on, that we need two oxygen molecules for every CH4. And so we can start to learn a little bit about ratios of these things. So let's do a couple examples. Let's say I want to make five um, molecules of CO2. How many molecules of CH4 do I need? What's my starting information? My starting information is five molecules of CO2, and I'm trying to get to molecules of CH4. What goes in my denominator? Molecules of CO2, and my numerator, molecules of CH4. Why? So this one can cancel, one on top, one on bottom, and this one I get what I want. Now how do I know this ratio? How do I know how many molecules of CH4 I need for every molecule of CO2? Well, I always get it from my balanced chemical reaction. And in my balanced chemical reaction up there, it's saying I need one methane molecule, CH4, to make one CO2. Not very exciting math. And we need five molecules of CH4. How about something a little more exciting? If I have 18 molecules of water, how many molecules of CH4 did I need to burn? And so here I'm not going to write out the problem, I'm just going to set it up. I say, hey, I've got 18 molecules of oxygen, how many molecules of CH4 did I burn? I'm going to have this ratio here. What goes on the bottom? Molecules of water on the top, molecules of CH4, right? Because we need molecules of water to cancel. We need to get molecules of CH4 in our answer, and we do. Now we do the numbers. Where do we get those numbers? From our balanced chemical reaction. And we get them just by looking at it. We don't try to fix them. We don't try to make it better. What it says is that in order to make two waters, we need one methane. To make two waters, we need one methane. Numbers stay attached to their units. Don't memorize the two goes on top and two goes on bottom. Numbers stay attached to their units. We need two molecules of water made from one molecule of methane. And so our math is pretty easy here again, and we get nine molecules of CH4. But you remember, we weren't talking about molecules for a long time because molecules aren't the scale of things in lab. The scale of things in lab are moles. What if we had 18 moles of H2O? We wanted to know how many moles of CH4 we made. Would it look any different? And the answer is no. Because remember, whether we're calculating, count, counting molecules, dozens of molecules, or moles of molecules, the ratios are all the same. That's what we did with those M&Ms and the car examples. And so, we actually get the same, that for moles of CH4 and for moles of H2O, we get the same numbers from our balanced chemical reaction. Two moles of water require one mole of CH4. And we get the same answer, that nine moles of CH4 are what we produce from, or what we need, sorry, sorry in order to produce 18 moles of water. So we're going to stop here. This was a longer video. We're going to do some more examples in the next video. I just didn't want to make this one too long.